This week's episode of This Is Only a Test is brought to you by Rackspace. Did you know that Rackspace can help guide your migration to Amazon Web Services? Rackspace support for AWS offers tooling and automation for account management, security, and best practices. Learn more at rackspace.com slash your cloud. Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, April 27th, 2017, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Hello and welcome everyone to this week's episode. We are all back, back from the conventioning, a crazy month of events and marching and rallies and pop culture. Uh, Joining me are my two co-hosts, Jeremy Williams. Hello. And Kishore Hari. Hello. Mayor McCheese. Hey, now he's made an appearance on all the Tested podcasts. That's right, all two of them. Was that his first time at Silicon Valley Comic Con? Yes, yep. that was Mayor's first time there. Wow. Um, I'm Norm, of course, and we are recording this actually on April 26th. So, Kishore, happy Alien Day. No. <laughs> no. Uh-uh. Uh, I, saw, I saw there's like, um, there's one more ridiculous one in May. I was like, where? Why, we, why, why all these. May? Why? No, no, there was another one in May. Like, you know, so we know uh, May the 4th is coming. But Which, which let's let's be honest here. Hold on, I'm uh, clipping just a little bit. Uh, May, May the 4th, May 4th as a pop culture holiday is, they're all corporate constructs. I don't know if any of them derive from the fan community. Uh, but they, whether or not they, are, they, belong to the, they belong to the corporations now. And uh, in April, Fox has created 426, a tenuous connection because LV-426 was the planet in the first Alien film. And so April 26 is when they celebrate. Uh, and guess what? We are part of that celebration. Well, ha- we are. Happy what do we do? Day. Do we, are we like hatching a xenomorph somewhere? What's it's going incubating on? incubating all of us right now. Oh, you know that nice. coffee you drank yesterday? Oh, yeah. no. Oh. What am I supposed to do on Alien Day? Just look up or what? What am I doing? Well, it's just like, what are you supposed to do on May, May 4th? Well, I don't know. But like Earth Day, you know, I, I really make a concerted effort to put the compost in the compost bin. <laughs> <laughs> what am I supposed to do today? Uh, you're supposed to think about the Alien franchise and appreciate it for uh, what is oh. given cinema. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, I guess there were events happening. There's a live stream going on, or I, oh, has been on already. I don't know if um, if that's been archived. Uh, but because there is a new Alien film coming out, um, they, the Fox is using this opportunity to maybe reveal some more stuff about that film, um, some of which we have taken part of. So uh, we have a video on our YouTube channel that you guys should check out um, that we can finally confirm and reveal that Adam, Joey, and I were on the set of Alien Covenant as it was filming in Australia, Fox Studios Australia, uh, last summer. And we spent a couple days on set and filmed a, uh, a miniseries uh, where Adam gets to really showcase and highlight some of the people who make this film happen, from the set builders to the costume uh, makers and the, uh, the creature artists. Um, and that will be rolling out on our YouTube channel uh, over the next month. That's cool. Cool. Yeah. Did you make it? On and as, as an extra, you just not, walk nope, into the background. Nope. Oh, we were once filming, so we were. Uh, I don't know how much I can say. We, I, can, I can describe it without giving specific details. I can tell you that uh, we went on multiple locations. So there was definitely in Fox Studios. It's like Hollywood. There's a giant studio facility where it's like hangars, big big buildings, big big um, uh, you know studio buildings where they build out sets and these are massive massive buildings uh where they would have to rebuild the entire like set of the dreadnought the alien ship that was in prometheus like the were the engineer fly their ship uh and then uh we also went and that's where a lot of the creature uh the, you know not, not set builders but also creature shops are so where they're making the the 
prosthetics and making the creatures and the the eggs. Yes, there are eggs in this film and the face huggers. And wow, all that what stuff. a spoiler! I know in spacesuits. Uh, and then uh, there's also on location. So they are, they shot on a location outside of um, Sydney, and they built a giant outdoor set there as well. Um, and they were filming out there for the most part when we were when we visited, and it, it was really cool to watch a film production at work. Now, I have done it before in visiting um, uh, the uh, Planet of Apes set, and that's a film coming out. We'll have some more details on that later. Uh, but just like just the how every, the, everyone has a purpose, and they are there. Are so many things come together to do these one shots, and when the filming started, we were we were. You know, by Video Village, we're watching like we would sort of stay out of the way. Video Village, so that's the place like kind of a tent with a bunch of cin- like cameras or uh, monitors. Monitors, where watching everything. exactly. Yeah, huh. and they have monitors being piped out. You know, and when, where everyone can take in their multiple angles. Uh, we went out at night for one of the night shoots. That's not where Ridley would be though. Uh, they versions of that hmm. probably. Cool. Um, and uh, you know, there's there are teams of people just running behind the scenes, just running GoPros, just running. You know, all the their giant camera rigs, uh, lots of costuming people running around. Um, so we didn't get to interact much with the the main cast, but we definitely uh, got to see how how the sausage, how the movie was made. Cool. So those that video series is the first episode's already on on YouTube. Uh, we had to give it a shout out to that, so you guys should check uh, that out. Uh, but in terms of other pop culture news, well, let's just jump into pop culture. Boom boom. You know, the most important thing that happened today, actually, was that I registered or attempted to register for <laughs> our Comic-Con hotels. Tell me that's going to be a video on Tested. Here's well, it's, what it's like trying to go to Comic-Con. It's, it's already a video uh, I've uploaded to Facebook. Thank you, Jeremy, for shooting it. But uh, Jeremy walked into the office this morning expecting to podcast. And Norm was said, like, Jeremy, I need you to go set those things up because in five minutes I need to be at the computer. And I mean it. He, and, and I meant it. Yeah. And, and I was bunkered down on the computer. I, if they explained to him, getting a hotel at Comic-Con isn't a matter of just going to Hotels.com and, and filling out a form and saying, I, want, I, want to, I would like to book four rooms uh, at, at the Hilton. No, going, get, getting a hotel at Comic-Con is like, a hun- is like the Hunger Games. Yeah. And, and it, is, it is a lottery system. There is a culling. And uh, there is a... Comic-Con has partnered with a, uh, a service to distribute the hotels, and so you have to apply for a hotel, and the way you apply for a hotel is you have to sit in a, a waiting room, a web, a digital waiting room, wait till the hotel registration page gets unlocked, get randomly placed into the queue, and then once you get into the form, submit the form as fast as possible, and they give you a sample form. It's like taking the SATs, give you a sample form to try out to so you have know all the fields and where everything is. And I had my sample form. I had my copy and paste notepad document full of answers, um, my six hotels I needed. And, and then I, as the animation rolled by and I unlocked the registration page, I went to work copy and pasting. Now I know how you always managed to order that iPhone before me. <laughs> oh, this is this is like Mondo posters. You're, pro- you're a professional. Is, yeah, I'm a professional click and r- refresh and copy paster. So I've definitely been there many times. I've been on that page many times, and like I'm tired of it. I don't know. Like it's worn on me a little bit. Does it tamper your enthusiasm for the con at all? Going through this bit of the process, tamper, or temper, temper. Yeah. No, I think tamper. No. <laughs> I mean, it can, right? I mean, you've got this is just a necessity. If you're going to go to the con, especially if you've got camera equipment, you want to be as close as you possible. Ha- I have to be, have yeah. to be. I mean, like we we've been. This will be at 2017. This will be my 11th, 12th Comic Con. It might be my 12th Comic Con. Wow. 11th or 12th? I, I've lost count. And uh, how long has it been this hard to get a room? At least seven years. Okay. Yeah. Wow, at least 2010, maybe maybe even more. Uh, in 20, 2012 was the first year you could do an Airbnb. 
and we were lucky. We did Airbnbs super close and before it exploded, and now Airbnbs are several thousand dollars a night. If you have a, a condo in San Diego, that's your vacation condo, you, you strike it rich every July, uh, running it out the full week. Uh, and, and it's not like there's a shortage of hotels. There are plenty of hotels in San Diego. It's just that hundreds of thousands of people need a place to stay. And so people do stay miles and miles away. I mean, when I was going to Comic-Con back in 2005, without any money, of course, we'd stay at a Motel 6, you know, uh, 20 minutes away from San Diego and drive in at 7 a.m., 6 a.m. to park in the parking lot. Now you don't even try to park in the parking lot. They don't even give you the option to park in the parking lot. That's hmm. all reserved for production hmm. and, and crew. It's insane. I'm ki- I'm kind of glad I'm skipping this year. Oh, you are skipping. Oh, you are. Yeah. I well, think so y- just one con's enough for you. No, no. But there are there are so many cons on the schedule now, including one that we went to this past weekend. That's oh, right, hometown Silicon Valley Comic Con. Now, not to be confused with the San Diego Comic Con, they are completely different organizations. Well, they have to have licensed the name or no. something. What? No, no, no. Yes, and you I, don't get to trademark Comic Con. Yeah, as a actually, name. they they're trying the Comic Con organization, uh, Comic Hyphen Con, which is includes WonderCon, Comic Con, Alternative Press Expo. Uh, they this that that's the big one. San Diego is the big one. It's one company. It's completely different from Reed Pop, which runs New York Comic Con, C2E2, and, C2E2 um, and completely different from the Emerald City Comic Con people. Comic Con is kind of a generic name now. It's kind of in, in the pop culture um, consciousness. It is, where are you going this weekend? I'm going to a Comic Con. Oh, I've never been to a Comic Con before. Uh, a Comic Con or Comic Con before. I don't but, know. If it's such a big deal, it means something. It would be like trying to make a new brand of Kleenex and still calling exactly. it Kleenex. You can't right. do that. Or Band Aid or right. Xerox. But uh, that's why, uh, like Silicon Valley Comic Con, no hyphen. Silicon, Ver- oh, Silicon Valley is that it? Comic Space Con. Because it stands for Comic Convention, Like to be, to be honest. Yes. Uh, but Comic Hyphen Con, they can apparently, I think they can trademark that. And they, there may be uh, some, some Terrible. Beef. Terrible. Yeah, I know. I know. But, but back to, the, to Silicon Valley Comic Con, which is, was founded by Steve Wozniak. Yes, in partnership with Steve Wozniak, he was like the he's like uh, like Stanley's Kamikaze. He's the figurehead, and he actually takes a huge part in in emceeing and introducing a lot of guests and and doing signings and um, and moderating panels. And you you wouldn't so necessarily Woz, associate Woz or technology with San Diego Comic Con. You wouldn't at all, or a comic book convention. Right. So the Silicon Valley one is an interesting um, mesh of t- high technology and pop culture. So their big logo is like the uh, is like uh, the Sixteen Chapel. Um, it, instead of it's it's two hands embracing, and one hand is an android hand, a robot hand, and one hand is a superhero gloved hand. <laughs> um, this is only the second year of the con. Last year, uh, last year I I participated in some panels. There's a lot of science and technology panels, uh, and it was great. But it it was definitely like first year con had to work out a lot of the kinks uh, in terms of just like registration and all that kind of wayfinding stuff. How was year two? I actually didn't go to year one either. I was I was um, I, I was in traveling. I was in China actually uh, last year when that when that happened. But mm-hmm. this year, uh, it was it was good. So it still felt like my sense of scale for these conventions is absolutely skewed because of things like New York Comic Con and, and San Diego, which are kind of the big ones on East and West Coast. And so it felt a little smaller, a little more intimate. The exhibit hall had some really cool stuff in there, but you know it's a little bit. Uh, you know, the, the, the convention hall itself isn't as dressed out or decked out as it is at the other conventions. You know, movie studios and, and TV networks aren't paying millions of dollars to build out two-story, three-story booths here. Uh, there, there were big booths, and people did bring really cool things like a uh, puppeted Ed Two Hundred Nine and some, you know, Blade Runner cars and a, a papercraft K Two S O sculpture, like some, like some really cool stuff to definitely check out. Uh, but you know, it, it was, and I, we spent most of our time actually not even on the exhibit floor. We actually sh- didn't shoot any uh, interviews on the exhibit floor this year because we were running our cosplay repair workshop, which I know both of you guys stopped at. Now. For you, Jeremy, it was your first time at a pop culture convention. At really? A comic I know. Book convention. I know. I'm late to the party. Have but... you been to a Star Trek convention <laughs> or a science fiction convention of any kind before then? No, 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 no. I, I, and it's not that for lack of of interest. I just, you know, I just haven't done it. Um, and I, but I was sitting around with my family, and I said, you know, we have an opportunity, ten uh, year old boy, son of mine, to go to visit this uh, San Diego Comic Con this weekend. Would you like to go? 
and we talked it over. And uh, despite his slight fear of crowds, we went and we had a good time. Uh, and I'm really glad that we did. What What do you think? Um, he thought it was he thought it was uh, you know huge for him. This was immense. I don't think he's ever been in a room with that many things <coughs> in, or people in it before. Mm-hmm. But he really dug the costume. You know, the kid's just coming out of that dress up phase, so he's still got that mm-hmm. little glean in his eye. Uh, he he liked the costumes, as did I. And, um, and what he, were either both of your expectations? Well, I mean, we watched a video of last year, and so we we kind of had a sense of what it would be. Like Adam walking the floor, yeah, doing incognito yeah, last so, year. So we, you know, and and we got to watch that live. We got to see Adam get dressed and prepared mm-hmm. live. Yes. And then we went out on the floor, and we just happened to see him there. That was exciting. But um, no, for 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 me, it was like I never understood how many of these people because when you see video and, and retrospectives on the cons, you, it's all the costumes. So you figure like everybody's in costume. Right. Um, so I wanted to see exactly what that ratio was and, and I was surprised how many it actually is. Like it actually is quite a lot of people it, in, in amazing costumes. Yeah, it was way more than last year. It was at least like triple or quadruple oh, what it was last year. So it, it grew pretty significantly. But this is definitely not um, like cosplay con. Like Dragon Con feels like it has like a higher ratio of people. Oh, in totally. Tra- Dragon Con, it would be you would feel out of place not wearing a costume. Really? At Dragon Con. Yeah. Here, I think it's a good mix where you can feel yeah. very comfortable in costume. You don't stand out. And there are definitely smaller cons where fewer people wear costumes. But then they're happy too because they they get a lot of attention and people take a lot of photos. Uh, and everyone's super nice. Um, I, and I, there's a great sign when you walk in there. It says cosplay is not consent. So it, you know, and then there's a text to explain that if you see somebody in a nice costume, don't just take their picture. Ask their permission, and they have the, the right to say no. And there's a zero harassment policy. It's it's a good vibe, it, and I got a really good feeling from that whole. It was fun experience. walking around this con this year because. It's not so packed in like sardines, like San Diego and some of the other ones. Yeah, they're big you, aisles. There's also a nice. The other thing I like, uh, and, and it depends venue to venue, is how big of a public space there is. San Jose Convention Center has a big outdoor area, has a big atrium lobby, has a big uh, two floors, and so it has lots of lobby space. Uh, so that's a nice place to take, catch a breather. A lot of costume cosplayers hang out there to take their photos. So they're not kind of locking in or blocking uh, the aisles. And uh, while the exhibit hall isn't massive, it's still pretty big. You know, lots of booths. You can do it in like half a day, going through all the booths. Um, uh, it's you know, it's it's very breathable. I, I was hoping for some cooler stuff to buy personally. Like you've yeah. you've come back from Comic Con with some really awesome models, Back to the Future car, for instance. Um, and I just didn't see a l- that. What I saw. Well, are you sure? Well, no. Well, I mean, so much of the exhibit hall now these days and these type of cons are, are retailers. Th- no doubt, no doubt. But it's all kind of chintzy stuff. Like there was a, an enormous amount of mystery boxes. Like that, oh, that's a yeah. thing. And I, I, I didn't expect that. That is a scourge upon cons. I don't even know. Well, well explain, box. explain what the mystery box is. I had to go up to you later and I said, "What's the deal with the mystery box?" Because like, there are various vendors. That's all they sell is a box filled with you don't know what. So this is about a, they're all the same. It's, it's like a Happy Meal, right? It's a, a foot by foot by foot <laughs> paper box, usually right. uh, decked out to look like some pop culture thing, whether it's a, uh, a Mr. Coin, coin a question mark box, From Mario. Or, or Minecraft box, whatever it's themed like, a Five Nights at Freddy's box. Yeah. Uh, and these retailers, they make these and they put an assortment of, you know, it's like blind boxing. It's cool. like, it's, it's, it's batch Blind box. So the blind box phenomenon has been around for forever, where you spend five bucks, ten bucks on a small box, and yeah. you get one figure in a foil wrap that you don't know what it is. Right. Right. And that's and that's fun. Kids love the mystery. Adults love the mystery. I love the mystery. It, it, this is a fascinating thing because but, the mystery is what you're buying, and you're buying, you're spending quite a lot of money at times. Here, like twenty to thirty dollars. I didn't see anything as cheap as twenty. Like uh-huh. they started around twenty five, thirty, yeah, and they went up to a hundred or beyond. It, oh, it's such a scourge, though, for my opinion, because it's mostly filled with crap it, it, it's it's all it's yeah. tchotchkes and it, it's, it's you know some of the guys they advertise like it's 35 dollars with a hundred dollars worth of stuff in. what does that mean it's arbitrary not, it's just not a hundred dollars this, this, this worth t-shirt of stuff. with the logo on it is 25 dollars and you know this figure right. that we made a, a million of is 20 dollars it's like a, like my my kid He's a Harry Potter fan, so mm-hmm. he got the Harry Potter box for fifty-one dollars of wow. his own saved money. What? And I tried to talk him out of it, but I was like, "Look, if, dude, if you want to learn this lesson the hard way, you learn this lesson." How long did it take by your that son to or to make fifty-one dollars <laughs> in know, allowance dude. money? Yeah, four dollars a week. Yeah, plus like holidays and stuff. That's so, that's three months, two and a half months 
of savings. And so I told him, look, man, don't open it because this is as good as it gets. <laughs> you, you have bought the mystery, and that is what your your money. So he still hasn't opened spent. it. No, he. So he held on to it. He didn't open it for the whole ride home. Did you show him J.J. Abrams' famous TED I know, Talk? I thought the about mystery it. box. I thought about it. You and pass then, this on to your children. We got home and and he opened it, and he's like, he's like, I hope I don't get socks. I hope I don't get socks. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I don't get a mug. And he didn't get socks, but he got a mug. And and but that evening, like you, he was just thirty dollar mug. All sullen, he walked in my office and he's like, Dad. That mystery box was a waste of money. <gasps> oh, oh no! no. Disillusion yeah. forever. He'll never go I back know. to a convention. Oh, I was I was heartbroken, you know. But at the same time, like you just gotta learn that. You gotta learn that lesson. Oh my god! He could have wow. bought so much with fifty one dollars for for a ten year old kid. Yeah. That is that's a fortune. I, totally. That is a king's ransom. Absolutely. The, the other thing you do is you negotiate down the price on Sunday because people don't want to walk away with those. That is true. I didn't see anybody doing that. Uh, you you can. So that's the other the secret of uh, for comic on is go on the last day for any of these conventions. If you're buying stuff. If you're, or, yeah, because it's fewer crowds typically. Uh, and also the retailers don't want to have to ship stuff off, so they often slash their prices or you can haggle a little bit. Now, many times the retailers will also try to charge you fees for credit cards and do cash only. Yeah, that's 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 bad. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I will say I had a lot of fun. For those that didn't watch Still Untitled, I went as Mayor McCheese. Your cosplay is my first time seeing it. My first time appearing on that podcast and for the second time mayor mccheese has appeared on tested though Fantastic. jeremy it's... jeremy seen him on this podcast but what did you think when you saw me though i, I can't said, i said there's sure hey look no the... you came up to me and you're like this looks way better in person than it did on the podcast it does it's a great costume it's a really it's good costume. totally a ridiculous costume that's great and i was At... i, I love that you ran into adam did you know he was doing his walk then uh, I figured he was doing a, um, his incognito walk early that day. I think Norm, you might have texted me that yeah. he was. Okay. And I, I, I was just wandering the floor, and I turned the corner and saw, um, you know, like a seven foot Chewbacca wandering around. So I was like, oh, I think that's Adam. Um, but I have to say, I went as Mayor McChee. My favorite part of that con are the panels because they have all these science panels. And so Mayor McCheese went to a couple NASA panels and learned a lot. <laughs> but it also must have been quite the non sequitur. A like Andy Weir definitely gave me a look as I walked <laughs> into one of the panels and sat down and was like, there's a cheeseburger here in this Mars panel. Oh, I'm really did, hungry. Where's did you take lunch? it off while you watched the panel? No. Wow. <laughs> That's commitment. Adam said he didn't recognize you. Oh, no, he didn't. He didn't recognize me. Well, how can you? I have a giant cheeseburger on my head. Was that Andy Weir doing a talk with Gary Whitta? Yeah. That was With cool. Richard Garriott. How about that? Yeah. That's an awesome panel. What? Yeah. When was that? It was uh, afternoon on on Saturday. I just huh? saw images on Gary's feed. It looks Sunday. like a, I, Su uh, Saturday, Sunday. Sorry, I missed it. Wait, what were they talking about? Uh, World about, builders. Yeah, building, oh, writing, nice. creating different... Um, in, uh, yeah. Are these panels Science online? Stories. Does Silicon Valley Comic Con stream that stuff? So, I'm not sure. I know that Comic Con hyphen Con, the organization, does put up their panels online and yeah. part of their um, their video, video on demand service. I don't know. If, I don't think so because I don't think they build that into their production. Um, but hmm. we did film uh, Adam's talk at Silicon Valley Comic Con, which will be on the site uh, hopefully later this week, as well as uh, Simone was there, and she was interviewed by Waz. Uh, she did her a cosplay as well. Uh, there's some photos of that on, on Twitter. Dressed as a, like a Mac SE or a something. A Macintosh SE. Was she lit inside? She was. That was cool. Yeah. No, we have a whole build for that on, a, on oh, our sweet. show. Oh, sweet. I want to see yeah, that. Yeah, Exactly. It's very uh, astronaut helmet-like. Jeremy, can I get a little bit of more um, monitor on my ears? Yeah. Um, so uh, did either of you pick up anything for yourselves at Silicon Valley Comic Con. I didn't. I'm always looking on the hunt for Thanos related merch mm -hmm. and it's coming close when it's gonna it's just gonna be everywhere. Uh and I was looking at a few of the I always hunting certain collectibles, but there weren't that many collectible booths. Um mm. so I, I almost pulled the trigger on some art because my favorite part of cons are going to Artist Alley and getting some custom stuff done. But I didn't. I also didn't have very many pockets on Mayor McCheese. This is a problem. <laughs> yeah, and carrying giant bags. You make your whole head a big like trunk. <laughs> um, I saw a cool artist uh, named Hearts for Hardware. You should, you know, he has a website. It's heartsforhardware.com, and he oil paints just classic game hardware. 
And so I was, I was. Oh, that looks great. I was oh. tempted to buy some of that. Like original art. Check out that twenty six hundred. I mean, it looks like a photo, and it's quite beautiful. And he has, he had prints there, but he also sells the originals. Oh. And of course, they started hundreds of dollars. But I will, uh, I, I was tempted. Very cool. Um, Bluefin, uh, which is the U.S. distributor for Bandai products, Gundam, uh, as well as among other things, uh, they were there. And so, uh, Jeremy, I believe you bought a Snap Fit kit. Uh, yeah, because you guys, you had one. Mm-hmm. Was it the X-Wing or TIE Fighter? Uh, we've built a couple of now. Sean actually uh, found them last year. Uh, they were released along with Rogue One. Um, there's Force Awakens ones. Uh, I'm kind of... Th- like they launch with characters like a BB-8 and a C-3PO, and I wasn't a big fan of those. But mm. the ships, huge fan of the ships. Because you see them on display, and you think, okay, this is going to cost hundreds of dollars because this is an insane amount of detail. But mm-hmm. then you, you realize that they're snapped together kits, just made from really tons, like hundreds of pieces of um, of injection molded plastic. Yes, and uh, so given that, like they're actually much like less expensive, twenty to forty dollars. Right, and so I picked up the Millennium Falcon, and then uh, it's probably going to take a few hours to build, and I'm going to wait because there's this guy in England that sells a light kit for it. Oh, you got to wow. let me know about that. But he's on he's on vacation, so I'm going to okay. pick that up, and then I'm going to build it. I too, after you picked that, I picked up the Millennium Falcon. I actually uh, got a Y wing, a Tie Interceptor, and coincidentally, when I got home that day, I forgot that I had ordered the ATAT. Um, and so that arrived. So I have four of them now that I got to make. So I got to warn you, what they have on display are painted ones that their expert modelers finished. Yeah. Like drew in panel lines and then and, and weathered a little bit. So we can walk through that whole process. But when you build it yourself, it won't look exactly like that. They still yeah. look great, but you don't look exactly like what they had on display. Okay. Yeah. Well warned. Yes. Uh, and... Um, other highlights, yeah, I, I mentioned there was a papercraft um, K two S O. That was unbelievable. But how large was that? It was, it was life size. Life size, like six, seven, seven feet, feet tall, what? and with a moving head and lights. What? And it was modeled, and um, it, it, it wasn't like a thing of first thing. He, the artist modeled it. A uh, previous uh, last year, um, he had made a Iron Man life size as a, 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 a English artist. Um, I'm trying to dig, uh, Google his name right now. Um, he made an Iron Man one, and then this year Silicon Valley invited him back to do a a, uh, a Owen uh, Gildersley. Oh no, Tom Tom Forsyth is the name of the artist. It was a collaboration. Um, oh wow! And his K two S O. That's cool. Yeah, Tom. His website is Thomas Forsyth F O R S Y T H dot C O dot U K and. Uh, it, it's it just like it I love it has that low poly. It, that's exactly it. it he, that's cool, and which works well with the paper. Light light we, b- bounces off the various panels really well, and the head rotated and and those light. When I it. saw it from far away, you you can't tell it's paper craft. Yeah. It's only when you start to approach it, you're like, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just astounding, and I think there was an Iron Man on display next yeah, to him that was that also was from paper last craft. Year. Yep, which was pretty impressive too. Yeah. I don't think the files for these will be released. Um, it's probably keeping itself, but it would be fun to to build one of these. <laughs> God, wow! I guess that would be a lot of work. Uh, and um, w- right after Silicon Valley Comic Con this week, I mean, we're back into production. We're back in office. Adam is actually out in Vancouver because we have the TED conference going on. Yeah, I've heard just phenomenal things about different sessions that are happening, but I just brought it up because there's one amazing short video that I saw, and that's. Uh, big dog from Boston Di- Dynamics walking over Adam, like yes. walking on Adam. Yes, I saw that. Uh, <laughs> this I, is I, the dog that people push and he's yeah. yes. uprights. Nice. Uh, I, I believe they reached out privately and we got them connected. And after they did a, their presentation, uh, yeah, They're, they met up. I, I, I'm I wanna so know, jealous. I want to know the conversation was like, okay, so we have this robot and he's going to walk on you. And Adam's like, yeah. Actually, that's probably exactly yeah. how that conversation. What do you mean walk went? on? Like, like that, cr- crawling that, on top? Like no, that's a heavy robot. You can't walk on somebody. That would be too much, no. right? It walked on his back. Really? Yeah. <laughs> put all its weight on Adam. Uh, I think it had probably two. Not all its weight. Two, two legs. Two legs. Wow. Yeah. Two legs at a time. Adam didn't look like he was in any distress. It smiles all the, <laughs> the whole time. Yes. Wow. Uh, we should uh, fire through the rest of pop culture news. Yeah, a couple of bunch of movie news. Okay, we know Jurassic World 2 is coming out. It's not mm-hmm. the director of Jurassic World 1. Okay. Uh, he is now directing episode 9. Uh, so uh, that's Colin Trevorrow. Uh, Jurassic World 2 uh, is, but now uh, has a new cast member added. So 
regardless of what you think, they're Jurassic World probably wasn't the best. I only saw it like the once. Had no real interest in seeing it again. I actually didn't see it. Oh, you didn't see it? it I'm with a, I'm with Norm. It made a ton of money. It, the, one of the things I really didn't like about it was uh, who the villain was. They they took a lot of things that we loved about the first film. And just just it was a lot of a lot of fan service. Uh, but maybe this is another act of fan service. Jurassic World two, Jeff Goldblum, he's back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean that's good. Wait, thing. he good got thing. eaten. He didn't get eaten. What are you talking about? Wasn't that, he that, in that was the a, toilet? That was a lawyer. Oh, wait, 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 whoa, 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 whoa! Do you need to leave, Kishore? <laughs> <laughs> I might need to leave. I can't remember. I Dr. mean, Malcolm didn't he, didn't he was the up- hero of Jurassic Park two? I mean, Lost I, World. I remember him uploading the virus to the ship in Jurassic. Oh, oh different. <laughs> <laughs> now, now you're just trolling. <laughs> Yeah, Jeff okay. Goldblum with Chris Pratt back. Is, yes, Chris Pratt okay. and uh, um, Dice Palace. Is uh, he Del- playing the same character? He must be. Oh yeah, He's got I don't know. He's it could be, be like speaking. kind of a fun cameo no, nod kind of thing. Yeah, well, I mean, the fact that they made uh, B D Wong's character the villain in Jurassic World, I thought, I thought it was it was a terrible decision. You know, but speaking of Independence Day, I did get to meet Data. You met Brett oh, Spiner? Brett Spiner. Yeah, yeah. of Independence Day. That was fun. First of all, that is the worst reference to meeting meeting Brett Spiner. What? Speaking of Independence Day. Come well, on. You said uploading the virus. Oh, what, wasn't fine, that fine, Independence fine. Day? Yeah. Yes, it was. All right, but all right. still, come on. Now, that was fun because my family, as you know, we've been watching the Star Trek Next Gen. Of course. So the that was, update. and that he is our favorite character. We've all gotten had a family meeting and decided Brent Spiner is our favorite actor on the show. And uh, so meeting him was great. And sending that text, because my wife did not make it to Comic Con, sending that text of, of my son with Brent Spiner, worth every 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 penny. Nice. Okay. That's awesome. Back to your Lost World news. Well, well, that was it. Jeff, <laughs> Goldblum, <laughs> yeah. Jeff Goldblum's coming back. Um, uh, other bits of uh, Marvel, I guess, now news. Uh, Avengers 4. So... Avengers 4, they're filming 3 and 4 concurrently. Uh, originally, it was going to be Infinity War Part 1 and Infinity War Part 2, but now it's just going to be called 3. It's just called Infinity War. And um, Kevin uh, Feige has said that uh, it, the fourth Avengers film is has a secret title, which would be a spoiler for the film. And there were rumors that it was going to be called Avengers Gauntlet. I think it's. I think that's probably right. Infinity Gauntlet. I think Infinity War is going to be Thanos getting the gems, and then Infinity War four, Infinity Gauntlet. Or Avengers like, four, yeah, Infinity Avengers. Gauntlet. That feels like it's stretching out a whole lot of films. It feels very Hobbit like in terms of like this well, could have been just one film, but now got to wait two years just to see the fight. Welcome to Kishore's Marvel speculation corner. Um, my feeling is that he very cozy here. He's going to get the gems, and in so doing at least kill one member of the Avengers and and kind of lead to their disbanding where they have to go out and form the new Avengers. That's where like Captain Marvel and some of the other movies that are announced are going to come into play. And that sort of regroup is going to go take him on in Infinity Gauntlet. Hawkeye, there's going to be a scene where Hawkeye looks at his bow and arrows. He goes, eh, I'm probably not, I'm not up for this. Are any of the actors currently feeling a little Harrison Ford about being in the Avengers? Where they're like, me first, me first, kill me first? I think we've heard that from Chris Evans, uh, okay. that he's he's sort of done um, doing this. He's just interested in getting behind the camera and taking on some other roles. I wouldn't be surprised if Robert Downey Jr. is like, I'm out. Like, he's been doing this since, what, 08 now? Longer and, than anybody. And, I mean, and the he's contracts. not young, right? So Yeah. I mean, he's he's in a ton of them, though. He's in he's in the new Spider-Man film, of course. Um, I mean, it all it, it's kind of gone beyond the 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 real world. This it's all very fantastic now, which the fans are totally happy with. I mean, have you go going hard sci-fi or fun sci-fi? Um, speaking of which, Guardians of the Galaxy comes out next week. Reviews are out, and they're pretty good. Good. They 80, are pretty 80, good. They 80, are pretty stellar. No 87% kidding. 87% on Rotten Tomatoes, which I think is like a really good, if it was 99%, I'd feel a little more worried about like it just being a little too much of a lowest common denominator film. Hmm. Yeah, it's definitely not like the praise that Get Out kind of earned. And earned, by the way. That was amazing. But it's like high enough that I'm like, oh, yeah, baby. And, and uh, you know, not much of a spoiler here. But they, um, what I've heard is that it's much more emotional Good. than mm. you would expect from Guardians. The first one went so fast. I watched it twice. I still don't know what planet they were on half the time. 
But Planet you, Nowhere. <laughs> that was the head? That was That's the, the head of a nowhere. celestial. Yeah, that's, yeah, that was confusing. And then wh- what planet is the collector on? What's that about? No, he, he was, was in nowhere. Spa- he, he was in nowhere. He was in oh, the he was space in station. Nowhere? The, the, astro- the head at the turned to a mining uh-huh. colony. Jeremy, this isn't much of a spoiler, but if oh, you're man. if you're gonna have problems with planets, it's hard. This one is gonna be a tough. <laughs> yeah, this is gonna be a tough film for you. So to wrap your head around. Yeah, that was a pretty that was a pretty good inside joke. Yes, yeah, no, I, I agree. I completely agree. <laughs> um, all right, uh, maybe maybe a different type of superhero fair is uh, is or is what we need. And uh, in 2019, they just announced. Did you guys see? Uh, did you guys see the last uh, M Night Shyamalan movie? No. Uh, no, I saw the first two. <laughs> yeah, I saw so through saw, Unbreakable. <laughs> that's, right. That's it. I, yeah. I, I, I think a lot of people would agree Unbreakable is probably a high point. Film people love Unbreakable. I love Unbreakable. It came out in I think 2000 2001, and it was a um, a real world t- take it seriously superhero film. I thought it was stupid. You didn't like Unbreakable? No, I thought nothing lives up to six uh, six cents. <sighs> Did you like Unbreakable? Sure. Not really. What? <laughs> Am I the only one in this room who loves Unbreakable? Well, yes. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yes. Creepy, creepy fake might like Unbreakable. Uh, you guys got? I, I would say rewatch Unbreakable. Oh, I got better things to do, man. Oh. <laughs> <And> this news <laughs> isn't for you. Uh, so the last, uh, I'm not, sh- then you guys probably don't care about the spoiler uh, that I'm about to reveal. Hit it, me. Okay. So it was revealed in, at the end. So the last M. Night Shyamalan film, uh, which was called, uh, Split, and it was James McAvoy, and it's about, like, uh, uh a guy with multiple personalities who one of his personalities is like a demon and he kidnaps these girls and, uh, it's a, it's a horror film, right? And the big reveal at the end of that film is that that film, that that character is set in the Unbreakable universe. Oh. And he's he's a supervillain. And that the next film will be the return of the Unbreakable character. Oh, you're excited. Okay. Yes. So there will be a M. Night Shyamalan superhero film culmination. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then that, that's, it's going to be called Glass, and it will be out in 2019. And I hope... I really hope that um, uh, that uh, Samuel Jackson comes back mm-hmm. as Mister Glass. Me too. Why? For your sake. Why is this guy still making films? <laughs> I'm hey, sorry. Films aren't that bad. I don't know. Signs was not good. I did see Signs. I'm remembering that. Now. That was that the Mark Wahlberg one. No, so, that, the Mark Wahlberg one was a really bad one. <laughs> <laughs> that was when the trees came for you. They get progressively worse. So Signs is the Mel Gibson one yes. with Joaquin Phoenix. And the big twist, if we can all remember, is that the aliens were afraid of water. But the bigger twist, I think the thematic twist, is that everything that happened happened for a reason and that his wife died and, and his loss in faith in, in God and humanity was, was, uh, was all for this purpose for Saving his family. I, I still struggle with the aliens are afraid of water. Let's invade a planet that is three quarters oh, yes. water. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cool. There were some tense moments in there, though, in in, <laughs> in the film. Uh, he keeps giving himself bigger, bigger and bigger roles. Yeah, I think he had to give himself like the best, the best line in that movie. Um, and then uh, what was the the woods? What was that that one? Uh, yeah. Oh yes. Um, it's like yeah. The village or something. The village. The village. Yeah. Norm, you're kind of the Paula Abdul of M. Night Shyamalan reviews. You know, what, what? <laughs> you're just you're nice. You're easy going on them. You like you see the good side. I said I appreciate yeah. the good stuff. <laughs> I, I, he knows how to make a film. Yeah, we need Simon Cowell in here. Oh boy, you can beat the Simon Cowell. Uh, also out in 2019, and this is new. At least the release date is, of course, episode nine. Yes. And shocking. So wait, shocking. so that that comes out Christmas 2019, right? Let's let's tell let's let's have it in your head. You know, come 2019 May when you're like six months more till Star Wars. Jeremy's coming out next week. Wow! They just changed the release date. They it's never May 2019. They never move movies up. They not never, this far. Not you know. this big budget and important. No, they give them it, as much time to breathe as they need. Is or, this sort of like production because of the Marvel thing? Because they have Infinity War two whatever it's going to be called, was slated for December of that year. And you can't have episode nine and an Avengers four in the same month. You think that's why they moved it, moved one? Maybe. I, I don't know. I honestly have no Maybe. idea. I, I don't know if the timing just works out for 
Um, to be fair, they always intended to do this, though. Well, like, they, they intended because they pushed Episode Eight back. Right. Episode Eight was going to be a May release, and then it was pushed to Christmas, uh, and Episode Nine was going to be two years later in May. And so maybe they're back on schedule. They're back on track. But then you figure Episode Seven did so well at Christmas, and that just justified it. Maybe Rogue One didn't do as well as they hoped. No, 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 no. I don't know. No, no. Why leave that Christmas lot? Uh, or maybe that's well, why we have the Christmas stop. They there. don't have a big Marvel doesn't have and Disney doesn't have a big um, summer slot, May slot mm-hmm. for 2019, and Star Wars is the closest thing they had to being ready. I I do actually wonder how much they manage this, just as like a hyper local. We're just worried about Star Wars, or does Disney look at this as like the entire ecosystem, including all of their animated stuff, like all the. Or oh, theme Pixar parks too. Stuff, yeah, all of that stuff together. Could, they could must that signal Star Wars Land uh, uh, an opening for? Yeah, that won't be open by then, though. No, it won't. Hmm. Yeah. What? So what's the actual day? Twenty fourth, twenty fifth, because twenty fifth would be the anniversary of the first one. Oh. oh. Whoa. Okay. All right. Blow my mind. Right there. Well, I'm happy. It's May twenty third. Not two days before. May 23rd. Speaking of the original, though, did you catch any of the new footage or old footage? I loved it. Oh, that was so good. From Celebration. Yeah, I guess it was the last day of Celebration. Uh, somebody from ILM did a, did a talk, and I only saw the clips, but uh, there, were, there was footage that they didn't use in A New Hope of many things, including the roundtable discussion in the Death Star where uh, the Senate had just you know um, been disbanded. And but they they give prelude to that like they give the dialogue that led up to those discussions that you're so familiar with and alternate takes and the original voice of um, dude uh, who plays um, uh, Darth, Darth Vader. Vader what's yes. his name that the bodybuilder um, but just hearing his voice come from Darth Vader's mask just gave it was giggles throughout the audience and it was uh, I mean that's why they didn't use him that's why they used James Earl Jones yeah. because uh, David Prowse David Prowse uh, didn't have the voice that. Lucas wanted, but I love these clips are great. They, and there's some of um of a uh, who is it Ro- Red Leader, um in the cockpit. Red or Gold Leader, yeah, one of those, one of yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's great. It's and great. and it's great to see that kind of um, raw footage without the sound effects. Yeah, and see how they did the lighting, the sh- hard shadows on their faces. Uh, there's a little bit of cursing in in that clip. Yeah, uh, but it's it's again like like you said, uh, really great that that kind of stuff gets unearthed. And I think part of that is talking about how they use some of that footage. Uh, for research for Rogue One, and in production for Rogue One, how they composited that in um, into the the, the scene. Um, last couple stuff uh, we talked a little bit about this last week, but this weekend is the premiere of American Gods uh, on Stars, the Neil Gaiman Gaiman uh, adaptation from his uh, very popular best selling uh, novel. Sure, you've read the book. I have read the book. It's a kind of an interesting fall from grace type uh, Olympus. Uh, take on those on those gods in sort of modern times. It's it's a I think it's one of my favorite Neil Gaiman stories. Do you like it? Like, I like Sandman so much. Uh, I mean, there's and no question that Sandman is is like the quintessential Neil Gaiman. There story. are so many themes in American Gods that just feel like echoes of Sandman in terms of um, sure. the modern take on on mythology. Sure, I, I mean, but. I guess I love Sandman so much, it, like I wanted more, and this was just you know f- feeding me more of that. Mm. Uh, and it, I found it a little bit grittier than Sandman in some ways. Oh, <laughs> apologies for that ridiculous pun there, but uh, uh, I think this translation to the screen ha- has it premiered yet on Stars? Uh, the thirtieth, I believe. The thirtieth. Are you are you gonna watch it? I gotta subscribe to Stars to get it. I yeah, don't. I don't have Stars either. So it's not on YouTube TV. No, 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 no. Uh, I think uh, the thing to do is if you haven't read the book, read the book first. It's a pretty breezy read. I mean, it it it's not that long of a book. It's, it's only a long a audio book. book. Oh, it's really? like nineteen hours. I what? Say. Oh, that's substantial. Nine, it's only a few hundred pages. No, isn't America? And there are many versions of the book too. It says it's a full cast audio book. That's the one to get. That's, that's cool. absolutely the one to get because it, it's 465 pages. Yeah, oh, a yeah, few yeah. hundred pages. Yeah, you can, you can get through that in a, in a weekend, no problem. Um, and then one last thing. Um, I saw the movie Colossal yesterday. What's that? Uh, it's in a Anne Hathaway film, and I want to get the... Um, She's talented. I, I like her very much. Um, 
it's directed. So the interesting thing is directed by uh, Nacho Vilgalondo. I'm pronouncing his name as Spanish filmmaker. Uh, but he made the film Time Crimes in 2007. I know that film. What yeah, is it's, that it's, film? A ti- it's a paradox, murder uh, mystery. Um, Sounds like something that's going to end up on Riff Tracks. No, it's no. great. No, Time Crimes is a time, this is a time sp- Crimes is awesome. Really? This is that Spanish it's, movie, right? Yeah, Spanish time loop film. Oh, oh, this one is amazing. The bandages, With the bandages, right? yes, the bandages. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Is it, so it's in, in Spanish? It's, yes. Wow. But you, it's totally, if you haven't seen, okay, Colossus in theater now, theaters now. It does actually it doesn't matter which order you watch this in, but Time Crimes, absolutely underappreciated and you should watch. Dude, it, okay. it is as a time as a time travel as a paradoxical time travel movie. Um, watch that, and then because it's, it's like it's in the script writing. So he also wrote and directed this new film. It's a purely American film um, called A uh, Colossal, right? And it is. Oh gosh, let me let me give you the spoiler free description that you can hear in the trailer. Okay, like the one um, woman moves back to small t- hometown in America and discovers. That she uh, that uh, at the same time a giant kaiju appears in South Korea and starts destroying the city, and she discovers that her emotions control the kaiju, mm. and that she is the kaiju. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that sounds like a good one. And that's that's the basic, very basic, basic premise without spoiling too much. Yeah. That's interesting. Do you ever feel like your emotions control other things? Because <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do sometimes. Like it, it's a weird thing. But I, when I was a kid, I always thought, well, maybe, maybe if I feel a certain way, like it controls the way that you know people behave. Else. Never mind. <laughs> I think this is a deeper conversation yeah, for def- the after definitely. podcast. Let's move on. Yeah. Right, we got new Echo devices out announced today. <laughs> this one may not be for you and me, but it's definitely an interesting take that Adam. Uh, I want to uh, test that it. I want to test it right now. Uh, it's the Echo Look. It's the most expensive Echo. Two hundred dollars. Yeah. So, uh, how is it different? Why is it so expensive? First of all, because it has a camera, it's a built-in camera. Now, why would the Amazon Alexa Echo? need a camera. Why does Big Brother need a camera? Well, obviously to track what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. uh, but what what does Amazon say that you're supposed to be use, using with this? This is part of Amazon fashion, that it's designed for your bedroom for when you're getting dressed, you can take <laughs> pictures and selfies of yourself in various outfits. It can be uploaded to the cloud. There is a machine learning interface to give you recommendations and style guides based on your looks. You can also record video so you can easily share your look to other platforms. I like this would this is different. Let's just say like I don't fit into the into the vertical that is interested in, <laughs> in wait, wait, wait. Let's go back and talk about exactly how you're supposed to use this. You have this installed theoretically in your bedroom or maybe your bathroom. Probably you don't want to put it in your bathroom. So no. let's say your bedroom next to your mirror. Because you use a mirror, like a stand-up mirror. Who needs a mirror with an Amazon, what is it called? Look. A- Echo Look. There you go. So it has a depth-sensing camera, so you can do, uh, like, blur out the background. iPhone 6S style stuff, iPhone 7 yeah. style, right? 7 Plus style. Right. And, um, but what do you, you, t- you, t- you put on your clothes for the day. Right. You put on your, your makeup. You take the photo. Well, not necessarily. One mode is just to get just a camera feed so you can turn around while looking at your phone and see what you look like from all angles. Wait, so you hold your phone. Yeah. And it's, it's like a, a monitor. It's a monitor for behind you. Yes. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's also called a mirror. Well, Two mirrors will solve that problem. That's what I'm saying. Who needs a mirror? With you, you, guys, you need Echo a second look. mirror. You, need, you would need a second mirror yes. to fulfill that. Uh, and then you take your selfie or you get a full length picture mm-hmm. and. If you're not sure about your outfit for the day, and who's sure? <laughs> who's ever sure? That's, that's all you have. A, that's why you have a, a closet full of hoodies. I, I'm still arguing about my outfit right now. <laughs> so they use an a, an algorithm to mm-hmm. judge you. 
Yes. Well, no, what, no, no. What you, type of feedback no, no, no. do you, you get? You send two options. So you submit two options to them, and they say, based on current style trends, which one looks a little bit better? <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> You're, they're asking you to put on two full outfits yeah. and looks, take pictures, and wait for the machine, and the machine will make a judgment call right then and yeah. say, go, we'll go with option well, A. I, yeah. I mean, before we ridicule this you know, too much, I do think there's probably a user base that's interested in this. It's just super, super narrow. I don't know. According to Amazon, it's a bunch of women with really expensive wardrobes. You know, based on the, they put out a video ad, and it was uh, like all women. There's one guy in it. The one dude is about. He's in the video for about three frames. And I, don't, I just can't imagine this use case of like you have to have your phone with you for this to be useful. Well, that's that's that's. Not a problem. Everyone yeah. has their phone. Everyone has their phone. But, I mean, it's basically instead of putting on your clothes and looking at yourself in the mirror, mm -hmm. you now have to put on your clothes, look, yeah. take a photo with your phone, mm -hmm. look Change at your the phone. Option. And, and then Change. also, I mean, Amazon's business of, one, gathering information about you, and two, selling you stuff, using that to sell you stuff. So now they know what you wear, what clothes you potentially have. They have, I bet they spend more of their processing, their database, deciphering what you wear and, and determining what the trends are, and they know your spending habits, so they know, okay, the rich folk who spent this much money, mm. oh, they own, their trends are wearing stripes, green stripes this year. Well, now I'm gonna go pass that information down to someone else who owns this Echo look and tells them rich people are buying green stripes this year, here's a green striped shirt <laughs> that you can buy on Amazon and maybe have it delivered later look, today. It, it's not gonna help you right now in the moment that you have, if you're indecision, but, Maybe you want to wear that later. You know, I think that recommendation engine should could be good. I mean, we know there's a ton of subscription boxes for fashion right now that do reasonably well. The other thing I've wondered about is if the camera is really good and you can force you in a situation where you like can calibrate, can actually take measurements of you. Well, th that those technologies have been around for a while. They have been, but if it's integrated into a shopping system like Amazon, that would be new. And calibration for those are extremely tough. Every yeah. angle, the height of the camera, totally, it, it affects the the accuracy uh, of those measurements. Uh, why isn't Amazon in the mystery box game? Honestly, <laughs> that's that's the money making business. Give me the Definitely. option to get, the, and you can just generate. Can you don't even imagine? have that curated thing. Just have the the, the algorithm generate a mystery box and uh, it's like a casino you know you're gonna get something great at least you know 49 percent of the time i don't think of amazon as being a, a really popular place to buy clothing from though that's the strange thing to me like i think of it as books and electronics and lots you of, don't think of lots it. of things. maybe a lot of people do think of it uh, as they as have as they as own zappos and so everyone's right. buying shoes. shoes but this isn't for shoes oh they should have done it for shoes that would have been brilliant wow. sneakers and and fashion shoes uh yeah I don't know. It's it's definitely strange. It's definitely strange. I, mean, I can see that they want to get Echo everywhere in the house. That's clear to me. Like I can understand why they'd want to make this product. I just don't understand the appeal. It's like it's two hundred dollars. It's a it's an always on internet connected camera in my changing room. I know. I don't like that. What? Don't like that at all. <laughs> I I have to admit, like while I have the same questions Jeremy does, I kind of want it to test it because it's gonna be like you have that same hoodie you had on yesterday. That's a different black hoodie. It's just going to like, be like, I would oh, that. you like black hoodies. Yeah. I, I do kind of think we need to test it for that purpose. Yeah, there was they did not represent my personal sense of style in the, their advertising video. Style. I would love to see I would love to see what it said about me. That would be great fun. <laughs> well, let's let's reach out there to any listener who may have an echo look. Uh, and can yeah. give us the full Look, report. So I don't want to spend two hundred dollars. No one's on getting one on the panel here. No, two hundred dollars. So. No, thank you. Though I will, I will reserve a small part of me that says, "Okay, maybe, Good. maybe Pro right. prove me wrong. Good. Like maybe there are people out there that this is going to be useful for." Hey, two hundred dollars. I can get half a Juicero. <laughs> A oh Juicero, Juicero, Juicero. We talked about this last week when Mike Mike was on the podcast, but now there's more information about this. So to quickly recap, you know about this, Kishore, right? I do. It is a now a four hundred dollar juicer. I thought it was seven hundred dollars. They've they've sla prices are slashed, <laughs> slashed, wow. slashed, slashed. A four hundred dollar juicer that you uh, have to use with these juice packs that they 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 sell. Uh, subscription service, five to eight dollars, however much it is. Uh, where it's a uh, chopped 
vegetables or fruits. Yeah, it's like that, pulped, pulped up. And, and not exactly masticated, but, you know, mm-hmm. cut up so it could fit in a bag. And then the juicer doesn't exactly masticate it either, but squeezes it so it's, you get your cold-pressed juice at, with a $400 machine. You can buy a bag that you can squeeze with your hands. That's the big controversy from that Bloomberg story. Well, the more interesting thing is Bolt, Bolt Bolt.io, which is uh, run by uh, VC, hardware VC, uh, took apart, one of the general partners at Bolt took apart the Juicero and kind of dissected why this machine costs so much. And it's truly fascinating, the The, engineering that goes into this machine. The teardown was Fascinating. It was in defense of the machine. It was in defense of the engineering of the machine. It, oh, okay. it was a, it was an explanation. It it wasn't justifying the business model of the company or the idea of, of selling ju- juice packs. Yeah. The fundamental business model of, of selling juice packs that people could squeeze that could also squeeze with their hands. Yeah. But it was offending why the machine was four hundred dollars. Oh. Yeah, and, and from, I think it was more curiosity of how could this be, and because it's very critical of like the I can't believe they did it this way. Yeah. at the at the very end. Hmm. Right, but it definitely says like this is why this thing costs so much, and it wasn't because they but but uh, it's Wi-Fi enabled. Like that's that's the joke is that you know they put a Wi-Fi chip in there. Now it's a smart juicer. That's why it's four hundred dollars. It's because it took a lot of engineering. There are a lot of custom parts, um, machine parts, injection molded parts, uh, to get it to that form factor so that they could press and apply a lot of force on these bags evenly across that surface area because of the design of their bags. Frankly, yeah, it basically shows that it has all these custom aluminum parts that were sort of like very precisely machined. Yeah, he said that of the hundreds of consumer products he's taken apart over the years, this is easily among the top 5% in complexity and um, astounding that a startup for their first hardware device could manufacture this machine. So he was impressed. There was, it was definitely impressive. Um, but also over-engineered. Way over-engineered, which is the, the necessary part. Yeah, and uh, hmm. the other thing, like the the drivetrain that that drives this, had like all of these like gear spin downs, so it like really maximized torque. Like this thing can really squeeze some stuff. Yeah, I'm curious whether it could be repurposed to do anything else, though. Yeah, fair, right? Um, I mean, the custom motors, uh, just mechanisms, just for the latch, the handled latch part, like the de- the the painstakingly machined custom parts. That's that you know cost when you say four dollars a piece that's a lot for manufacturing yeah. when you add up hundreds of piece components that go into a machine um it was just like it, it's like the the designers industrial designers and engineers got ahead of themselves and were so enamored with making a beautifully machined and engineered product that they didn't think about whether people needed this product at all the, i mean the real problem beyond the need product a problem there's like a science and engineering problem here too basically this machine is taking a big aluminum plate and squashing something flat with like a, a, a with torque just playing even pressure across that's not taking advantage of like a real basic fact that you get when you squeeze with your with your hands is like using the liquid to enforce essentially a hydraulic pressure as well within the bag they're not using the the actual material that they're squeezing to their own advantage. You mean like when I roll up my toothpaste to get more toothpaste out? <laughs> yeah, to a certain extent, yes. Ex- except there's even greater fluid dynamics here because mm-hmm. we're talking about true liquid fluids. And it's just not taking advantage of that at all hmm. here because it's just sort of applying even pressure across it as opposed to a, like sort of a top-down. Hmm. Um. Now, something that may also be over-engineered and not sure people want is, well, I think people do want this. At least they say they want this. I want it. Is the flying car. Why don't you want it? I don't think it's practical. But shut up, dude. It's fun. Uh, fun and practical. Mm, no traffic. Fast. Scary. That's why we have airplanes. Fun. Scary. I don't need my daily commute to be scary. <laughs> <laughs> my daily commute is scary enough. You gotta live a little. So, uh, Larry Page uh, has... Uh, has backed a startup called Kitty Hawk. That's Clever. a good, good name. Yeah, I think it is a good name. I mean, if you're going to have a car company called Tesla, Kitty Hawk is a more fun, novel version of that for the flying car. They've unveiled its first prototype, their first prototype. It's an ultralight aircraft that can, it's a VTOL, take off vertically, but only if you're flying over open water. Why? Why, why is that, do you think? Well, safety. Right? Yeah, I would think safety but is number one. What is it? Is it actually detect if there's water below you? 
There can't be a reason it takes off vertically on water any better. Than on land? Yeah. Are you sure about that? Yes. I think so. I'm going to go yeah. with yes. Yes. Well, the demonstrated, it, it flew over, uh, lifting over a lake, and then has, has uh, and then uh, it looks like a jet ski. I guess maybe for safety. So in case it fails, yeah. it drops down, and it's only on water. Uh, yeah, this yeah. thing has two pontoons on the bottom. And if anyone's seen the Colin Furs video where he built, like, a, lo- a flying machine with, like, a big... Uh, two big splitting blades, one in the front, one in the back, with like sort of a um, a protector kind of cover over it. This has a similar design to that, so I would say it's less a flying car and more like those uh, speed bikes from Jedi. Right. Sp- oh, speeders. whoa! Now you got me interested. Speeder bikes? It could totally be a speeder. Whoa, whoa, whoa! It doesn't go much higher than like six feet off the ground or of water. At least I, the, in the demo, they didn't do yeah, that. Yeah, this is not for flying above skyscrapers, and but it will be for sale later this year. Is this Larry Page flying it? No. No? No, no. Okay. No, I don't think so. Uh, and uh, you, the FAA apparently has granted permission for the startup to sell uh, and, uh, and for this aircraft to be flown in, quote unquote, uncongested areas. And flyers users will not need a pilot's license i mean as a record as a recreation tool like at lakes and you know so it's not the flying car or like a segway like you know if you rent one for the day yeah i can't imagine it in populated areas no but like over water to start yeah sounds like fun i would do that see now you're just like the jetpack over water do that do that too this but you can understand like with the as many of rotary, what are they like propellers as they have around the thing? You can understand how this could be stable. Yeah. I don't I, I, the jetpack. I don't understand how you're supposed to stabilize with that thing. But this looks a lot of fun. <sighs> Apparently, Uber also announced this Tuesday that it's going to roll out a network of flying cars in the Dallas Fort Worth area and in Dubai by 2020. Yes, this belongs in Dubai. Oh my goodness! So taking to the skies, they we haven't even solved the autonomous car problem on the streets below but the companies are already think trying to own the skies you know i I would just take them like treating women well inside their organization first before the flying cars let's let's start there yeah uh that seems a bit aggressive it's a moonshot why they announced city cities makes no sense to me no this is just to bump up their their stock prices a complete waste of money no it's not these guys have a ton of money to spend. They're spending their money. Uh, that sounds like the definition of a complete waste of money. What you just said. <laughs> no, 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 it is. No, that <laughs> is. But it's not to boost the stock price. This is just people spending money. So uh, the other half of Google, um, Sergey Brin, also has an aerial project too. Not a flying car, but this is an airship, a Zeppelin. Apparently, it's Bloomberg says that Sergey Brin has a secret Zeppelin that's being built in. Close to NASA Ames Research. We could drive there right now. That's Look the, in the that, hangar. That's the big hangar? That's good. That could be the big hangar. They're building a giant one right now. You could see it off 101. Yeah. I feel like I'm in a Bond movie right now. They're all Bond movies. These are all Bond villains waiting for who has bought the latest volcano. What? Why does he want a Zeppelin? <laughs> no one knows. Hmm. It, it certainly can't take many people anywhere. <laughs> It's not practical. Well, um, they're heavy. You can make them out of lead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. Uh, helium filled. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I mean, there are a lot of reasons at tech companies, a lot of practical reasons about building some infrastructure for the skies. And, I, and a lot of this, like, let's build a flying car talk uh, makes sense if you want to push regulation, push governments to lay out the... Uh, the the rules for the skies like it's it took the consumer drone uh, business really taking off uh, to force the FAA to to consider what it means for people to be flying up there yeah uh, because it just hasn't been a consideration and and people haven't thought seriously about it or done the research and you know maybe making a zeppelin now isn't a practical thing for cargo or for public transport and it, it does seem very much like an evil genius. Um, project, but there are things like having wind turbines up in the skies, uh, or uh, distributing internet from from balloons up in the skies. Like we're going to need all of this stuff figured out if we're going to be taking advantage of that airspace uh, for practical purposes. Uh, weird. 
<laughs> I think that's. Uh, I think Jeremy summed it Isn't up. Isn't there a helium shortage? Isn't this irresponsible? They supposedly found a new deposit in Africa recently, but um, that like this is ridiculous. Yeah, man, it's gonna put the balloon companies out of business. <laughs> Do we have something that's less ridiculous in tech this week, or is this all no, ridiculous? No, they're all, all pretty ridiculous. Now, the other big thing with Uber this week, of course, is the story that came out in uh, was the New York Times that Uber, back in 2015, was almost kicked out of the App Store. We may not... Back in 2015, Apple could have just shut Uber down for, completely. What did they do? Well, they, they subverted Apple's privacy rules oh in the App Store. And uh, you know, there's a lot of talk of deleting Uber these days. Delete Uber is a big campaign because of, of their internal practices and just like bad business practices, things unsavory things that may, may or not be going on. Um, and one of the things that they did back in 2015 was uh, subvert the App Store rules and track user IDs, device user IDs, after users deleted their app. Oh, no. So if you had the Uber app in 2015, you decided not to use it, delete your app, they would still track your user ID or have a record of your user ID. What does that mean? What could they track? Well, according to Uber, what they said they did this for, and they apparently don't do it now, apparently what they did this for was so drivers weren't able to buy stolen cell phones or second market, gray market hmm. cell phones and uh, artificially inflate their driving time or their bonus time by getting their own rides oh. or okay. or manipulating their system in some way. It's pretty far-fetched. Uh -huh. uh, but Uber, the CEO apparently, this according to the New York Times, directed their engineering team to not only knowingly subvert these privacy rules that Apple laid out, but also geofenced the Apple campus headquarters so Apple engineers would not detect this problem. Dude. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's very active manipulation. Totally. And uh, they can't do it now because all the the apps are sandboxed, and they can't they there's they you can't even pull that information now. But according to the report in 2015, Tim Cook had to make a phone call and get a personal rep and personally reprimand Uber CEO and say, "Stop it! Slap on the wrist!" Actually, <laughs> really, just almost a slap on the wrist. Uh, stop it or we'll take you off of the app store. They should have just taken them. They should have taken them off. Taken them off the app store. Wow. If this was Google, they would have been off the app store. Yeah, it would have been it would have been thermonuclear war. And this is that is awful. It is brazen. Um Ugh. I know. Um I think that's actually all oh, you know what? One last bit of uh technology news I do want to talk about. Have you seen this voice synthesis? program it's called Lyrebird L Y R E Lyrebird no so it's a startup that says that they can recreate your voice using just 1 minute of sample audio oh this is awesome yeah and uh, adobe has uh they've teased uh teased this before photoshop for voice yeah voco and, or is what it was called right and yep and it feels like voice synthesis is the next nut to crack this freaks me out a little bit. Oh, absolutely. Like, there's so many things you can't trust now. And with voice, it's going to make robocallers that much better. Wow. Um, well, it's going to make... Have you listened to any of these samples? They're not that great. Are these, are these oh. samples of the actual computer? Yeah, why don't we yes, play a sample? Right. You can unmute. I can't speak with so many different voices. Yeah, I'm not worried about I being I can pulled. speak with so many different voices. I can speak with so many... Dude, this is one step away from, from hawking. This is not convincing. It's not convincing yet, but th we're going to get there. Yeah. By the way, you guys ride BART? Um, from time I to don't, time? but I heard about the heist. Oh, I don't know about the heist. All right, tell no, me your th BART story this was just So I just realized that if you're headed um, e like inbound towards the city from the south... BART the, is our public transit system. The voice announcing the trains is male... It's like a male Stephen Hawking, and if you're headed outbound, it's a female Stephen Hawking. Ah. This is a little life hack that I just figured out. There you go. That's all I have to say. What was the, what? There was a BART heist? Yeah, so apparently this, this Saturday night, as we were all in San Jose, uh, apparently dozens of juveniles raided a BART station, commandeered one train car, and forced passengers to hand over bags and cell phones, and injured two people. Saturday night. Juveniles. 40 to 60 
juveniles. What? Flooded the station, jumped the fare gates, and rushed into the train platform, held the doors open, took over an entire train, and held and, and robbed everyone on that train. But then they're stuck down there. And and then they held the door open and then and then ran, ran out of the out. station. The cops couldn't get there in time? Yeah. Wow. Seven people were robbed, losing a purse, duffel bag, five phones, um, and some people were even robbed on, on the platform. Well, that's wild. Yeah. Do they and do they have any idea what group this was? No. How? Well, 40 the robbery to 60 it took less than five minutes, and the and some of the robberies took just seconds. Forty to sixty people, though. Some some that's somebody's a, gonna get caught. Crazy. There's too many people there. Were, they were armed. Uh, I don't know if they were armed. Wow. And they're not sharing images because it looks like the they were minors. Ooh, who that, did this? That's their loophole. Yeah. yeah. Huh. The other thing that was found out a few months ago: there's cameras in those in those cars, in those train cars. And what they found out in a sting operation is oftentimes there were just blinking lights. There was no camera inside. Those that happens in a lot of places. Yeah. yeah. Deterrence. Now, just don't, visual don't say deterrence. that. Don't say We don't want to say that on the, out in the public. This is a podcast of the truth. All <laughs> blinking lights are cameras. Do not steal. Speaking of theft, Grand Theft Auto V is Very online, nice. is releasing a new uh, mode, which may be out by now. But it's it's re- super cool. Now I haven't played Grand Theft Auto V since I beat the single player mo- mission, but this makes me want to go back in there. It's a top down racing mode where it looks like Grand Theft Auto One and Two. Do you remember these games? Yeah, like you know, old school. They throw the camera up in the sky and you you race through uh, these brand new stunt tracks top down with all the GTA Five physics. It sounds like a blast. That this sounds is a, fun. This is a really good idea. Well done, Rockstar. Any more news? I think that's it for uh, technology news. Now, before we move on to our next segment, I do want to also thank, these again, the sponsor of this week's episode, and that is Rackspace. Did you know that Rackspace can help guide your migration to Amazon Web Services? With hundreds of innovations each year on AWS Cloud, many companies are seeking assistance from certified experts to meet their business outcomes. Whether you're planning to move or already use to AWS, Rackspace fame fa- uh, fanatical support for AWS is the answer for businesses facing these challenges. Rackspace has deep expertise and experience in public cloud transformation with more than 770 AWS certifications and counting. They're a premier consultant partner certified in AWS DevOps as well as AWS marketing and commerce. They also provide tooling and automation for account management, permissions, security, and best practices, control your cloud costs, and sleep at well at night knowing Rackspace will monitor your AWS 24-7, 365 days a year. Learn more at rackspace.com slash your cloud. Now it's time for a moment of science. Uh, so I think there was a pretty big science happening this past Saturday. Big science. Um, so the March for Science happened. Um, for those that don't know, uh, you can listen to Still Entitled this week. Uh, I was heavily involved. I was one of the leads of the entire thing. I uh, liaised and oversaw all of the satellite marches around the world. There's 610 total. And um, I, I was sort of at a loss because I had stayed up from the first marches in New Zealand all the way through um, the last march, which happened in Hawaii over that sort of like you know, 24, 26 hour period by the time it was done. And um, I, like it, it was just so humbling to see marches around the world and people were marching for really, really different reasons. Um, and, the, and the reaction's both been, there's a lot of goodwill. Like no one saw this coming a few months ago and for it to go from nothing, like a social, somebody started a Twitter account is how this whole thing started. Um, to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people around the world marching is is pretty remarkable. Um, And it was like, there was all sorts of parts of the process that were kind of messed up. And like, it wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, But I'm left very hopeful that there is this generation of of people that have blurred the line that, um, uh, or at least dispensed of the notion that science isn't political because it has been since the time of Galileo and that it's okay to stand up and, and make your voice heard on this. Um, uh, especially on some critical topics like 
the fact that our current president doesn't have a science advisor and every president going back to Eisenhower has had a science advisor. So it's weird, a little weird that we don't have that conversation happening. Um, and there's a difference between science being a, not political and being nonpartisan. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, to me like the the reason I one of the reasons I joined is that it was designed to be nonpartisan, meaning that the the march organizers were going to advertise um, a a march that wasn't about campaigning or rallying for any particular candidate or party. Uh, that doesn't mean people didn't take policy stances, um, but it it does mean that it was uh, meant to be inclusive of of voices from around the uh, around the world. Uh, I think by the time this airs, we'll have Adam's talk from the San Francisco March uh, online where he gave a, sort of a be- beautiful gesture. I'll just say, like, um, uh, I, I mentioned this on Still Entitled, but I brought my dad on stage um, at the San Francisco March to talk about how we, um, you know, immigrated to this country and, and that his um, acceptance to a science program was uh was the reason that I can exist here and, and one of the reasons our, our family has, has succeeded here. And uh, to have him up there with me, um, it, w- it meant everything uh, to me, uh, especially in the context of talking about uh, keeping our, our borders open for the good of, of science, because science is better uh, when we bring in those voices from abroad. It's been the engine of good science in this country for decades now. I feel like the, the march came out of uh, well, it seemed to me, like from my point of view, that the idea from it came out of the Women's March. That you saw the success of that, and then you said, oh, let's keep this momentum going. Let's stand up for something else. And it, and it was the voice of you know, science should matter to everybody. Yeah, I, and there was definitely afterglow from the Women's March right. that I think gave license to more people getting out and doing this. Um, but I, I would say the, the critical point that, that did this, uh, at least for many of the scientists I knew, they felt this sort of malaise that there's been this erosion of of trust in science and and a feeling of just anti-intellectualism, like an, uh, a bias growing in the population of where they um, get information. Why is that? Why do you think that that exists? Is that in pursuit of money? Is that because science is at odds with making as, as many dollars as possible? I mean, I, I think there's, there's definitely... Um, uh, forces that are looking at monetizing this, but it's also a consequence of just modern times where we do get siloed, we get into echo chambers, and and confirmation bias is like a is just a huge factor once you're in those silos. And good science really tries to tries to not perfect at it, really eliminate that and get past those barriers. But if you live in a world where all of the people around you that you trust, all the like your your family members your, um, uh, you know, your, your teachers, your, like everyone that you interact with online is saying global warming is a hoax, you're going to probably start to believe that. And it's not that they're presenting data that you're analyzing. It's that, it's that the, that's how we get our information oftentimes. So how do you keep the message of the march from getting partisan? I mean, how do you keep people from, say, people you, who, who believe that global warming, warming is a hoax how do you keep them from feeling defensive? How do you get them included in the conversation? I, I think this was less about you know people that that don't feel um, uh, that that feel that have views in opposition in science. This was about rallying the people that feel like science is an important value to them and activating them to do more. This is like a step to really have a, a surge, if you will, because we've never done anything like this before. Um, you know, the only um, equivalent that we could you know, find in history was there was a 1970s march of farmers on Washington, D.C., where they pulled up their, like, tractors, like, never had an occupation do something like this. Um, and so it's really about creating solidarity first. And then once we have that, now we can start to take actions together because now we have these millions of voices around the world. You don't feel like it, the march itself was a, trying to send a message? I think it is. It's, it's a huge public statement. But I don't think it was a public statement to be like, now you're going to change your mind if you don't believe global warming is real. That Like a march can't do that. Right. A march is like activating the people that in their local communities are going to become more advocates for science. Was it, did, you, did, you, um, did you like the interpretation of the, that the media had of the marches? I mean, 
who's ever happy with a media interpretation of something? Well, that what they did you do? find was the angles that the media took? I think um, there was a lot uh, pressed on the conflict, both from like old guard scientists who felt like science is apolitical, let the science speak for the science self. I think there was a lot of conversation about how there were, there was voices that wanted the the science march to represent um, uh, where science needs to go by being more inclusive and more diverse and the conflict that arose from those. Uh, and I think that got a lot of coverage. Um, what I wanted to see more coverage of is what this look, it looked like in local communities because it was focused on DC nationally, hmm. naturally, and, and the big cities. But there's a town in Michigan where you know 500 to 600 people march. The population's only 4,500 people. Like that, they don't have science events. They can't. They don't have a big university research center. Like what is that means something yeah. there? Um, and I think it can mean something for years to come. Uh, the march on DC. I don't think any politician really took that much note to what happened. It was another thing that was happening. Were they the largest group? I think the DC March is probably the largest in the world, um, but like Chicago had sixty thousand people, San yeah. Francisco was close to fifty thousand, Minneapolis had forty some thousand people. So there was large marches everywhere. But I think the story is going to be told in these small communities, oftentimes that I had never heard of these cities. That's how small they were, like Alexandria, Minnesota, which is like you know an hour from the Canadian border, had a march of a few hundred people again in a town of ten thousand. So. Though those are the places where I think any actionable impact will will be reflected, and I think that's where it's most important because that's where science has done the worst job of of reaching out to. Well, in those smaller places where maybe not a ton of people were able to organize or they felt disconnected from what was going on, it happens all the time. Where can people find like is videos or other places archive where they can get energized by the things that happen on Saturday? So at um. A lot of that's being collected and aggregated and it'll be on marchforscience.com. There's a week of action taking place right now in different pillars like science education and communication, um, outreach, advocacy that are happening every day going through Saturday. Um, so there's actions that you can take. I still think the most important thing is on that hyper local level. Like those people that if you went marching, those people that you met, those people that you marched with, whether it be teachers, farmers, scientists themselves, um, staying connected to those forces and coming up with a plan on the local of local levels. That's how you're going to affect change. You had talked a while ago about scientists getting more politically involved, mm -hmm. uh, running for office. Even. Yeah. And it was, was the, is, this is all kind of a part of that same energy, isn't it? It's just being yeah. involved. Yeah. I mean, there's a really famous uh, fly biologist, uh, Mike Eisen, who um, is running a Senate bid right now in California to unseat Dianne Feinstein. Um, and we've seen a surge of, of scientist candidates now come out and try, both try and are trying to run for office over the next uh, few months. I'm, I'm sort of of two minds about this. I don't think just that occupation uh, is a qualification for office. But I also understand that there's one scientist in all of Congress, which feels like hmm. a bit of an underrepresentation. Who is but that? I think there, uh, his name is... Um, Bill Foster, he was a physicist at Fermilab. Hmm. But I think there's bigger underrepresentations in Congress to deal with than just scientists. Um, but it represents an outcome of, of what this is. Um, I hope it's not a flash in the pan. We'll see where it goes. Uh, but standing on that stage in front of thousands of people um, with my with my dad, and they're they're cheering the story of, of science and the people that do science as much as anything else. Um, that gives me a, a lot, a lot of hope for the future. Well, thank you for organizing this, helping to organize it. I got to say, one my biggest jelly moment, though, Silicon Valley Comic Con had a March for Science. And, like, so people are in, like, costume, doing, like, pop culture stuff. Rachel Bloom, who's one of my favorite, like, comedians, like, emceed that thing. Ugh, jelly. <laughs> <laughs> you can't be everywhere at once. <laughs> All right, on to a, few, a couple of science stories. All right. Um, we have something when we do science events called the warning bunny. It's a, it's a, we usually put up a slide of a bunny to warn you that something kind of not okay is going to come on the screen next. Visceral or gross? <laughs> yeah. So, wait, this, well, is, this is a universal practice? This is, uh, it's a localized practice, but okay. it's, we're trying to make it universal. Oh. So, this is your warning bunny for the next story. So, um, researchers have now tried to create an artificial womb. 
uh, in Philadelphia. What they did is they took lambs mm. that were gestated to the equivalent of a, of a human baby being uh, about 22 to 30, uh, 22 to 23 weeks, which is about the earliest survival that a human baby can um, be born at and put them in an artificial womb, which is like a plastic casing with like hookups for uh, essentially an umbilical cord um, and for some waste elimination and saw if they could keep alive a fetus, like essentially a lamb fetus um, uh, for an extended period using this artificial setup. And they were able to keep the fetus alive for four weeks, which is a incredibly um, huge uh, leap forward, like almost 4X versus where they were before. Um, so this is a fetus a, that already was at, not in a good place. Exactly. So it's a phenomenal leap forward. The the imagery that I'll I'll link to might be disturbing for some because you're watching like a a lamb in a in a plastic sack essentially. Mm -hmm. But it's a phenomenal achievement. And um, really, this is about can we extend fetal viability for humans in the future using an artificial setup. Jeremy has the look on his face like he watched the video. I did. I just, I just saw the <laughs> lamb. So I, I take it the lamb didn't make it? No. Oh, my goodness. It, okay. it did not. But it's an extraordinary achievement. That's why it has to be in uh, this week's Moment of Science. But warning, bunny. Two final notes. Let us bid adieu to Cassini. The probe that has been sent to Saturn is doing executing a final maneuver. It actually started yesterday. Uh, when you're listening to this. And it's an amazing final maneuver. Mm. It is flying in between Saturn and its rings. Oh, cool. To get an incredible flyby of um, understanding certain atmospheric conditions on Saturn before it, it finally gently ends itself in hey, Saturn. Hey, there's no solid core to any of the gas giants, is there? No. Like okay. Jupiter, if we could put it in water, would float. Or Saturn would, too. I went to the um, the um, what's the museum in, next to in, in Golden Gate Park, California Academy. Yeah, I went of to Science California Academy of Science, uh, with my family who was in town, and we went to the um, to the theater in there, Planetarium, and Planetarium. And for the first, I guess it's a new show, but it's not narrated professionally and done like a, you know, they hit play. It's a live narration, and you go on a journey. It's basically the powers of ten. Redone. Mm -hmm. Have you seen this show? So they yes. do it. They do it occasionally. It's an ongoing one, and they have um, a curator um, or, or the, one of the directors do it in between. The, they rotate between that and the the one where they hit play. Oh, okay. Uh, so I, this is the one where they render it in real time. Yeah, and it was fantastic. It's like starts out like a Google Earth kind of thing of the planet, and you keep going back and back and back till you're outside. You know, can you, basically after 20 minutes, you can see the whole universe, the whole visible universe. Blew my mind because there were there were things I'd never considered before, and I consider myself somebody who's thought about this a little bit. But the fact that we can only see in two directions out into the universe because the Milky Way is so clouded. Yeah, yes. we we're in a disk. We can't see laterally. That our view of of stars in the universe is like the center of an hourglass, and it goes upwards and downwards. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. So I, I just wanted to throw that in. I also love that the center of all of these galaxies that we're talking about, the you know hundreds of millions, billions of galaxies out there, at the center of virtually every single one we've ever observed is a supermassive black hole, uh, larger than any other black holes ever uh, imagined. So we're <laughs> rotating, flying by around the center of a gigantic black hole. I think that's cool. Yes. Terrifying. But in the grand scheme of things, not it's gonna affect us. No, not gonna affect us no. at all. No. Did your family enjoy that? Enjoy the, the planetarium experience? Um my son, yeah, my kids did. Uh my my mom did. Mm. My stepdad fell asleep. Uh it's hey. very it's a very comforting <laughs> what environment. You, what are you gonna do? Yeah. yeah, it was comfortable in there. Uh, it is pretty nice in there. You can uh what you can do uh if your kids enjoyed it is there are a lot of VR and desktop versions of those, uh, Universe Sandbox included, that you can have them explore and yeah. get a very similar kind of curated experience. All right, save it for the VR Minute. We got one last thing. Uh, if you're watching this um, on Thursday, yesterday I was on Twitch. Tw uh, Twitch this week had a week of science, and um, which in their world, they've been airing nonstop the original Carl Sagan Cosmos. Oh, which cool. is awesome. I, I watched it first watched it when I was eight. My brother sat me down and popped in some VHS tapes and it was um, I 
I still remember watching those. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we're going to have a, a roundtable discussion, like some friends have tested, like Phil Plate will be there. Um, but I will be on Twitch yesterday, which is not helpful <laughs> for a live streaming service. Um, but I encourage you to check out uh, any remaining pieces of Cosmos, and they'll have Andrewian on on Friday, um, the uh, wife of, of Carl Sagan, uh, talking about the legacy of Cosmos. Bill Nye's new show is live now on Netflix. Yeah. I've you... only seen one episode. Yeah, and I've only watched 10 minutes of that episode. What, what did you think? Uh, I think it's... Oh, I saw a global warming climate change episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, uh, it was good. Uh, I think there was a lot of of kind of gesticulating at the audience. Um, and so I'd like to see... I want to watch more to see how the format breaks up. Mm-hmm. That was co-head written by, by Phil Plate and uh, Mike Drucker, who... Uh, is also a friend of Tested. So I'm excited to see what they, they do, um, especially with the correspondence when they go out and try to talk to other people. The first episode had Charlie Kloss, who's a model, as a correspondent. But I want to see him get into more esoteric stuff. Yeah. The VR Minute. Virtual reality this week. All right, not a ton of VR to talk about this week. It's a couple new releases on the Oculus platform. The big release is, of course, Wilson's Heart came out this Wednesday. It goes, this is their uh, once a month big AAA title on the Oculus platform. Uh, Jeremy and I, we haven't played the full game yet, but we did play a couple hours of it in our hands on time uh, a little over a month ago now. Um, but this is a story driven. Uh, VR experience, black uh, and white, black game. and white, Twilight Zone inspired, supernatural. Um, I gotta, heard it's about ten hours. Ten hours, uh-huh. uh, and that's what I'm curious about: whether how much that ten hours is puzzle solving, how much of it is going back and forth, retreading, how much of it is, frankly, just there's a little bit of loading time between jumping uh, between environments, yeah. and how much uh, of that is just being scared. Yeah. Not right. to, not to keep go as fast as you can. Yeah, because it's, it's about tension. Yeah, it's, it's a game that wants they want to keep you in that environment, um, and you're not freely moving around, so you are just jumping from node to node, kind of solving puzzles, you know, and connecting those nodes together with, with between the objects that you pick up from one place to another. Um, can't wait to play it. Uh, in the same vein, uh, Arkham VR, which was released as a PSVR exclusive, is now also on the Oculus platform. Mon- Very similar game, actually, oh. uh, to, to no. Wilson's Heart, in terms that it's, it's mm. a story-driven puzzle, puzzle game. Puzzle solver. Puzzle solver where you jump from place to place. Yeah. Uh, but And every time you jump to a different location, every one of their, uh, the environments is a different type of puzzle. I thought that was interesting about the Arkham VR. Is that it's, it, There's not a whole lot of replayability to that game, but it's like they had several different VR experiments, and they found a way to tie them all into one game. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting game. That's yeah. that. That's twenty bucks. Wilson's Heart is thirty bucks. Forty bucks. Is it forty? Yeah. All right. Um, and then uh, something that we've been big fans of is Rec Room. They have a new quest mode. We haven't even beat the old quest mode. We got to get back in there and yeah. take care of some Dude, business anytime. Yeah, we got to do it. But this new one is sci-fi. It's like you, they, uh, they had a whole texture set, all the models for the for the classical fantasy. Yeah, I would have been happy with another one of those. Right. But they decided to go in a whole new direction, and they made a sci-fi thing with laser guns. Laser guns. Same kind of thing. Like, the enemies are clearly on ropes, and they've made it budget, which is super smart. Totally okay. Yeah. And uh, I- Probably wasn't cheap, but like in terms of not having to script super intelligent AI, build it in, still right. in the world of a of a school. Exactly. I, can't, I would love to play this with you guys. I can't wait to um, play around with, like, uh, they must have fun, like, reload mechanics and all sorts of, like- Kluji stuff with the guns too. Mm-hmm. That'll yeah. be fun. Interesting thing about the fantasy one was there were two different classes you could play as: either a bow, which um, you couldn't hold a shield because you needed both hands to fire, or sword, and so it's melee based sword and and shield. I don't do those two classes exist in the sci-fi version. I don't even know. Right. But I, I would look forward to finding out. I bet you there's multiple weapons. Though. Yeah. And um, I think that's it for just some quick VR talk. We're, we're going to be doing a bunch of VR demos uh, in the coming weeks, and we'll have that on, on projections. So oh, you got to watch it there. Wait, can I ask about um, – there's a projection episode that's been in my queue that I haven't watched about the haptics. Yes, the Dexmo. Yeah, you want to yeah. talk a little about that? Uh, we we uh, released that video. So Jeremy and I got a demo of a exoskeleton VR glove. Uh, that not only tracks fingers, where your finger positions are, but also 
uh, gives you force feedback. Yeah, the tracking is strong. Like mm -hmm. that's really cool to see where your fingers are, not just in 3D space, but actually, but you know, relative to each other. This is really cool. Something that doesn't doesn't suffer from the occlusion that like the magic leap would. You can't have one hand in front of the other. This has no problem with that, and that's super cool. But the you know, when you see this device, you don't think about that. You think about the haptic feedback. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that's not as strong. Um, is it just buzzing on your arm? No, no, no. I'm, and, which is not to say it's not strong enough in terms of the motors, but because they can't control your arm, you know, and they can't mm -hmm. control your wrist, they can only control your fingers. It's almost like it works best if your hands are locked in space and you are just moving your fingers. Uh, and I wanted, I wanted more of a sense of feeling things than I got. Um, it's almost like I was fighting it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if, if you could spend more time with it and learn its limitations, I think you could learn to work with it. This is not a device I think that they're going to sell to a whole lot of consumers. Uh, so I, I think that they're going to find a market for this that is beyond you know, even our purview. Do you, do you feel like we've talked a lot about you know, adding trackers, whether it be the, you know, the Vive trackers like on your feet and, and whatnot. Did this give you a sense that, that additional tracking is definitely where things are headed? Just give you a lot of optimism for that. Well, I mean, near term, it, in terms of the f haptic feedback, it gave me a lot of pessimism because, mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 as much as I want it, it's, it's we're in a real time of be careful what you ask for because mm -hmm. the limitations become clear immediately. Uh, as far as the tracking goes, I, I think you know people who are doing mocap on a budget are going to fall in love with this kind of thing. Mm. You know, this could be huge. Testing this week. Hey, what have you guys been testing? I have an update. Oh, yeah? Oh, good. So I've been watching, uh, I've been using YouTube TV now for a while. And I, my initial reaction was I loved it. Just the inter user interface so much better. Um, I was using it both in my office and then I was casting it to my screen. And now that I've had it for a week, like a couple weeks, I'm starting to sour on components of it. Hmm. And it goes back to something Norm said early on. I'm having some quality issues um, with it that it's not consi uh, consistently always streaming at the level of quality I want. Um, and I'm starting to feel the, the channel limitations more. Um, and I wish it would send me some notifications. It doesn't do like it doesn't talk to me. Um, even though it resides on my phone, um, I have to open the app for it to really um, give me any information about like what's in my library, what's what's recorded, all uh, what's coming up. Um, I feel like that could uh, change a little bit, but that quality piece is starting to bug me a little bit. Okay. What about the the lack of stations? Does that bug you at all? I mean, it's it's hurt because right now is um, it's playoff time in both the NBA and the NHL, yeah. and the NBA uh, games here in the states are on the Turner family of networks, which are not included in the package. So, can't watch certain things that I was I was looking forward to seeing. Now, are you, do you think you're going to keep it? I think I'm going to keep it for the for the near term. For it's it. thirty five bucks. You're not paying any of the premium stuff. Part of me wants a because you knew a ship to four people. Is, uh, yeah, is you can watch three things at the same time, like you can watch the same show, same live feed, three on three devices. But you can have um, five in your family that have access to it. But it's still three total yeah. among that five. Uh, you're only, I assume, using it on one device at a time. Pretty much, yeah. I would say let's find four people and share it. Yeah, let's do it. Because I I don't mind paying the extra seven eight eight bucks. Is it? eight bucks a month uh to get access to to live the interface and live tv and dvr actually is, is a big thing because i don't pay for dvr right now on my phone i think that's that's a not a bad idea yeah i mean it, it's interesting um i've been trying it more in mobile settings just away from the house just watching tv on my phone like on transit other other situations like that uh and that's where some of the quality s stuff has bugged me but having access to that on the go has been great has been phenomenal. Yeah. Um, have you ever tried spoofing your location? I haven't yet. Um, uh, because, uh, like, spoofing your location gets you just 
slightly different local channels. Well, but when I'm, you're traveling, yeah, I haven't I haven't really traveled heavily yet. I'm mm-hmm. going to New York, um, you know, in, in about uh, ten days coming up, uh, and I'll see. It also is it's integrated in my phone. I would think it could auto detect too. So um, I'll try that out though. Uh, very cool. Um, and, you know, uh, this past weekend at Silicon Valley Comic Con, a fan came up and brought over his Galaxy S8, which I actually haven't used. Oh, it looked really nice, that GS8. I don't understand. The edge. There's a phone you haven't seen yet? Yeah. We don't have the Galaxy S8. Mm. Uh, Ryan has one, um, and he's been doing a review for us. But seeing in person, uh, very the thing uh, is much lighter than I thought it'd be. I mean, the edge, edge screen, when you when I hold the phone with very small bezels, same thing with the LG G6, uh, you don't recognize, I don't realize how big the screen is, um, which I, I don't know if that's going to be a problem for consumers because if you, if you hold a big phone, even if there's a lot more bezel, like uh, the iPhone, you know, the, the Plus phones, 5.5-inch screen on a pretty big phone, the new phones are coming out this year, I think will have bigger screens on smaller physical phones and lighter physical phones, but I don't know if people are going to make that association until you, uh, it will have to be hammered into their brain with advertising. Because uh, if you just showed someone and did like a blind test, uh, I wouldn't be able to tell which screen was bigger unless I was holding them side by side. Wow. I, I just keep hearing amazing things about how fast that phone is. Yeah. It's pretty pretty snappy. Um, um, I have an update. Oh, yeah? As well, yeah, my... Um, we, my kids, my kids and I finally got around to making that game in Game Maker. So Game Maker Studio Two is that drag and drop um, programming language, essentially, where you can you don't have to worry about typing in the syntax. You can drag your blocks in and you know fill out your variables by hand, uh, and you can make games. The whole thing is custom tailored towards making games. It's kind of like an evolution of of the Scratch program out of MIT. And um, they spent my my daughter did all the artwork and my son did all the coding and design and and I helped where where they got stuck, and they made a little asteroids clone, and uh, I'll put it up on my Twitter. You guys can play it. We ported it to HTML5, and uh, it's it's this is a good tool. Like if you have any interest in in game design, absolutely, I'm I'm totally convinced. If you're if you don't want to like get into the industry and you just want to make a game, don't worry about Unity. J- dive into Game Maker, and uh, y- if you're happy making 2D games, although you can do 3D, but if you're happy with 2D and you just want to have fun and, and make a game, t- you know, see if you love games or you want to test your game design abilities, uh, download that that software. It's really really cool. And check out my Twitter at uh, Jareware. It's my latest tweet. You can play the game. Very cool. And you can always, of course, find Shore at Science Quiche on Twitter, and you can find all of our stuff at Tested.com on Twitter and YouTube. Uh, thanks for joining us this week on This Is Only a Test. We'll be back, I think, next week with another episode. Um, more stuff, of course, rolling out from Silicon Valley Comic Con and other events we're going to. Uh, and we will see you next time. Do we have an outro this week? Oh, probably. I don't know. I was too busy tweeting. <laughs> Let's see here. They're not going to hear this episode until you, a couple hours after we, we record. Do you know what we have to still test? That Pico Brewer. I, yeah, I was just about to tell you. After Is it still podcast, in the box? We still have the Pico Brew, and we need to make our beer. All right. That's coming up, Tested. If you have any recommendations. Hi there. I didn't see you. Tested. I haven't listened to this one, so I hope it's not super offensive, but it featured Cookie Monster. Bye.